The Center for Information Assurance and Cybersecurity presents Unintended Consequences of the Information Age, a colloquium series that explores controversial issues emerging from our point-and-click world. Our infrastructures, online and vulnerable. Sponsored by the UW Institute for National Security Education and Research and the UW Master of Strategic Planning for Critical Infrastructures online graduate program. With additional support from the Information School, the Pacific Northwest Center for Global Security, and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce Professor Hilda Blanca. Hilda is the Chair of the Department of Urban Design and Planning and Director of the Masters of Strategic Planning for Critical Infrastructure. Please join me in welcoming Hilda. Thank you, Dean Bruce. I am very pleased that our colleges and centers are collaborating to bring this important panel to a broad audience. Our panel today is focused on industrial control systems. This is a topic of great relevance to the new masters in critical infrastructures protection, which I will briefly describe in a minute or so. Critical infrastructure is a term of art coined in the late 1990s by a presidential commission. The definitions of the term, as you find on this slide, emphasize how certain infrastructure systems are vital to national defense, economic prosperity, and quality of life, and how their protection is vital to the country's well-being. It is worthwhile also to point out that over 80% of these systems are in the private sector. These systems have been deemed especially vulnerable today to accidents and attacks due to their interdependence. And as you can see from uh, this figure published by the National Research Council, their interdependence is quite complex. However, uh, what is also clear is that these systems are particularly dependent on electricity and information technology, as you will see right here. The topic of this panel, industrial control systems, is thus vital for the protection of all infrastructure systems. And even though these systems are not separately identified as a critical infrastructure, in effect, they constitute a critical sector which requires attention and study. Let me now take uh, the opportunity to tell you a little about our Masters in Critical Infrastructure. Our program is new and conceived in the aftermath of 9-11. And it was uh, started in January 2004. As a matter of fact, I'm very pleased to, uh, to tell you that our first distinguished panelist, Joe Weiss, is one of the first graduates of our program. The program is also delivered entirely online, which is convenient for professionals working full time, and of course is fully accredited. Its mission is to train leaders in infrastructure management to take a strategic approach to the security and management of these systems vital to our nation. Blending a strategic planning and systems uh, theory approach to enhance the more traditional emergency management uh, perspective. Students in the program take two courses per quarter for eight quarters, including methods courses and content courses that focus on various infrastructures, such as cyber security and physical infrastructures, as well as provides a capstone uh, project. The curriculum includes the teaching of a great variety of skills, including systems theory, emergency management, geospatial analysis, or GIS as we call it, naturalistic decision making, cost benefit analysis, and uh, business continuity, among others. In conclusion, our program is a unique blend of an analytic framework to, to management and protection of infrastructure systems, 
technical learning about specific infrastructures and a case study approach which combines both methods and content know-how. For further information on the program, please see our website as uh, found on this final slide. Now, I would like to introduce you to our moderator, Barbara Endicott Popovsky, who is the director of the Center for Information Assurance and Cybersecurity at the University of Washington, and who is most responsible for bringing this important series of panels uh, to the public. Barbara will also introduce the panelists. Here's Barbara. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to introduce Joe Weiss, who's an industry expert on control systems and electronic security systems. He's had 30 years of experience in industry, 14 of them with EPRI, the Electric Power Institute. And he led a variety of programs there, including a program on nuclear power plant instrumentation and diagnostics. He's also been involved with embedded systems program and the control system and cybersecurity program at EPRI. He's been very active in IEEE. He's a, been a director on the ISA the Standards and Practice Board. And he's participated in the 2002 White House Conference on Critical Infrastructure Protection. He's been an invited speaker in a variety of venues. And he's received numerous awards, with uh, one of them happening here about a year ago when he graduated from the University of Washington's Master's in Strategic Planning for Critical Infrastructure. So I'd like you to join me in welcoming Joe Weiss. I wanted to thank Hilda for inviting me to be part of this gathering. It's not quite august, but this gathering. And I really appreciate being here to be able to talk about a subject that uh, is somewhat near and dear to my heart, which is cybersecurity of the industrial control systems. What I wanted to do to start out with is just try to give a little bit of background about what it is that we're talking about, how prevalent they are, and what it really means. First thing is that industrial control systems are those systems that control processes throughout the industrial infrastructure. It's electric, water, oil, gas, chemicals, food manufacturing, mining. It's all of these things that essentially produce or transmit something. It's a global enterprise. These things are done not just in North America, it's South America, Asia, Europe. And our suppliers are also international. Our suppliers are headquartered in North America, our suppliers are headquartered in Europe. We have suppliers headquartered in Asia. So what we're talking about is truly a multinational, international relationship. What does become interesting about this, especially as you start talking about cybersecurity, is that these systems, from a cyber perspective, are almost identical regardless of industry and regardless of location, which basically means the training is the same, the control system architectures are the same, the types of sensors and drives and analyzers that supply these systems are the same, and even all the way down to the default passwords are the same. Now, I wanted to also bring a little bit of grounding to what it is that we're talking about. And I'll assume that there are a number of people that this is new to. So what we're talking about, SCADA, which is a supervisory control and data acquisition system. This is a very specific type of control system that's usually used for very geographically dispersed industries, which would be electric transmission and distribution, water distribution, oil and gas distribution, Distributed control systems are the large, in a funny sense, central station, major type of control systems used in power plants, refineries, steel mills, water treatment facilities. Programmable logic controllers started out being discrete control. 
for things like assembly lines. But as the, the, the um, microprocessors have grown and as the ability to program these systems have grown, the distinction is starting to blur as to what systems will be used where. The field devices are the devices that, me that actually do the measurement, that do the motion. They could be drives. They could be pump motors. They could be a remote terminal unit that gathers the information. They're a breaker that actually opens and closes switches. These are like what you have in your house the fuses that protect the electricity in your house. This is what protects the large equipment and substations. Even meters. In today's technology, meters can actually do not only monitoring, meters can actually do control. And consequently, when we talk about industrial control systems, I wanted to get across this is not SCADA. This is the world or the universe of industrial control. Now, one of the things that is important to get across is that these types of control systems are very different than the traditional IT systems used in banking, on your desktop, etc. The technology these systems use are different, their reliability considerations are different, and how they are employed is different. What gets to be more of a security issue is that these differences are now being melded together with the traditional IT. Now, again, to give a little bit of, a, of, of an explanation, a control system generally consists of two parts. One is the operator interface. These are the large screens people see where the, op the operator is sitting in front of his Microsoft Windows architecture. That is more of an IT type of system. When you compromise it, generally what you're compromising is the data flow going to or from that system. It can lead to a loss of view of the process, but it's generally a short-term interruption. The field devices, on the other hand, are what really separate a control system from a traditional IT system. These systems do not use, generally speaking, a commercial off-the-shelf system like a Microsoft or a Linux or a Unix. These are proprietary real-time operating systems. They are very deterministic in their nature. That's why it took so long for Ethernet to make its way down to the factory floor because they cannot tolerate any type of bit error. But the important part when it comes to security are these are the, the devices that actually control the process. You can get to these devices, not only as people normally think of from the internet, but these devices can be accessed by other means such as dial-ups. These are the devices that when you get to them, can cause the actual equipment damage, personnel safety issues, environmental spills, environmental compliance or regulatory compliance. This is where, in a funny sense, the rubber meets the road. And what's more, there is a fundamental dichotomy that occurs. And that is, the more secure your process is, the less agile that process control can be. So we are constantly in a battle between how secure the process is versus how flexible and agile and, and the actual performance of the system. And what needs to be made very clear is in the world of industrial control, performance will beat out security every time. Until that paradigm changes, security will be a subset. And in my view, it should always be a subset and not the primary driver. This is a picture of a typical operator interface. As you can see, you've got your displays, you've got your workstations. This can look similar other than for the big screens, like what you have on your desktop. 
And the next, on the other hand, would be typical PLC, meaning programmable logic controller hardware. This looks very different than what you have on your, on your desktop. This is where you actually store and, and execute the control system algorithms. This is what tells a valve to open. This is what tells you that you've overshot a set point. This is where control actually occurs. And the important part is, this doesn't look at all like what you're used to. Now, the background was, where did this all come from? Control systems originally were very isolated, very, very specific, one-of-a-kind computer devices. They were almost a computer device in name only, but they were a computer device. Security was never a design feature. It was reliability and it was performance. Well, productivity changes, cost, Government mandates, particularly things like environmental control, have forced us to move from those old analog days into the digital 21st century. And it's put us in a position where we're essentially backfitting or trying to bolt on security onto systems that were never designed for things like that. What this is going to lead to is not only a security challenge, it's also very much going to lead to reliability concerns because we're going the absolute opposite way of what we've always been told to do. Keep it simple, stupid. This is going the other direction. And what's important to point out also is security is still not a major design feature even in today's systems. Now, this next slide I hope can go a long way toward the program the University of Washington has because this is a major issue that we have. And that is, why are there so few people who really truly know what to do about securing control systems without affecting their performance? What you'll see in this Venn diagram is the IT world, the traditional IT world, is a very large world. And within that is IT security, which is still a pretty substantial group of people. On the other side is the control system world. It kind of shows as if it's almost the same, but it's significantly smaller. What you see in that middle, which shows as a circle, is not a circle, it's a dot. That dot has maybe, in my opinion, maybe a hundred people in it worldwide. Part of the issue that I see in the, in the need in the world of education, and you'll see some slides on this later, is the bulk of the people coming into this world of control system security are not coming from the operations or the control system world. They're coming from IT. They do not know or understand how these systems work. We need to get more people with control system experience moving to the security world in order not to have reliability issues crop up. What are the threats to these systems? These threats are pretty much the same types of threats as you would see with IT. Tar the targeted intentional threat is the lowest probability. It has the highest consequence where you see this coming from, one would be the disgruntled insiders, the other would be terrorists. One issue I think needs to be clear in today's environment where we're a downsizing in order to meet productivity gains, we are downsizing those people most knowledgeable with the systems. And in many ways, we are creating our own disgruntled insiders. The unintended consequence this is because we're moving more and more toward using commercial off the shelf without trying to point names at major players, but I'll mention names, Microsoft and Cisco. Because we're using them, we are becoming the unintended consequence of these viruses and worms that are meant to be targeted at a Microsoft or a Cisco. We use them. 
They're not trying to go at us. We had in the situation when some of these worms occurred that major infrastructures like railroads, water, chemicals have been impacted. The unintentional is simply because they can be high probability. The consequences vary. It depends what happens. But it comes because of inappropriate policies or inappropriate testing, trying to use IT technology or policies on these types of systems. Is it real? Yes, it is. There have been more than 80 known cases that I know of, both intentional and unintentional, in all industries. And the impacts range from trivial to equipment and environmental damage, and we're talking major equipment and environmental damage, to deaths. Now, there is a dearth of information about this, which is why it's so difficult to have a business case. One of the things that Richard Clark used to talk about is a cyber Pearl Harbor. Will we have one? No, not as he states it. Not because there can't be, but because even if there is, we may never know that it came because of cyber. We simply don't have the monitoring and detection to know that. And there is a major, major significant inhibition within the entire industrial focus to ever share this information. Plus, there is a major reticence to provide information to the government. And conversely, there is a major reticence by government to share any information back to industry. Dearth of education. This is what's pointed directly to UW, University of Washington. IT certi security certifications, the CI, uh, SSP, CISM, et cetera, do not address control systems. What they are certifying you for could actually lead toward impacting these systems. And there are very few university programs that try to address cybersecurity of these types of systems. The other thing I should mention is what really isn't addressed in the control system world itself is the area of information assurance. That's very standard in the IT world. It is absolutely not standard with us. The last is a dearth of technologies. Part of the problem there is, unless you know what the problems are and what it is you want to solve, how can you have a solution? In the control systems world, our focus is integrity and availability. It is not confidentiality. All of the new encryption algorithms in the world may or may not help us. We need technology that is targeted and aimed at securing these systems. And there is starting to be some work by the national labs and some um, private industry suppliers, but it is very, very, very few and far between. And I mentioned before a dearth of policies. The policies that are out there are IT-centric. We need policies specific to control systems. My summary is very simple. These systems are absolutely critical to the industrial economy and national security. Does you no good to secure a credit card if you have no infrastructure in which to use it? These systems are different. They are not the same as what you're used to, and they need to be treated and maintained accordingly. We need R&D funding that is specific to these systems. The $800 million or so that has been set aside as R&D money for cyber, there's probably no more than 25 or 30 million going to industrial control systems. And finally, we need more trained professionals. With that, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. I appreciate Joe's comments because they lay the basis for what you're going to hear in the balance of this program. Joe's described what control systems are, and he's shown you how they're different from regular IT systems. And he makes the case for an urgent need to address the dearth of research, the dearth of trained professionals in this area. 
We're going to move on to a more specific presentation of skater vulnerabilities, and I'm going to introduce you to our next speaker, Dr. Paul Oman, who's a professor of computer science at the University of Idaho, and he has some major areas of interest in his research that include secure communications and critical infrastructure protection. Uh, Paul has had grants from the National Science Foundation, from the NIATT and DARPA, and in the years 2000 to 2002, Paul was a senior research engineer with Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories. And what makes Paul so valuable is that he transcends both industry and academia in terms of the breadth of his experience, and he brings that into the classroom. Prior to joining SELC, Paul was the chairman of the Computer Science Department at U of Idaho, and he held the distinguished chair position, the Hewlett Packard Engineering Chair, for seven years. He's published over 100 papers and publications on various subjects related to security, and he has past association as an editor of IEEE Computer and IEEE Software. He's a member of IEEE and remains a very active uh, member of IEEE, and we're very pleased to have Dr. Oman here with us this evening. Thank you, Paul. Oh, thank you, Barbara. Uh, thank you, Hilda, for organizing this. Um, University of Idaho, huh? Small school. Does he know what he's talking about? Well, University of Idaho, we don't have a whole lot to be proud about, but we do have a very good computer and network security program. How good? So good that we're recognized as a center of excellence by the United States National Security Agency. So good that we're recognized as a cyber core school by the National Science Foundation. So good that we're recognized by the Federal Highway Administration to conduct work in a secure surface transportation. So we don't have a lot to be proud about, but we do some things very well. And I am very proud of my participation in those. And some of the stuff that I'm going to be showing you today is from those programs, the Center of Excellence program, the CyberCore program, and the Surface Transportation program. Um, critical infrastructures, you probably have heard or seen these before. A lot of these are privatized. Electric power and other energy, water resources, banking finance, transportation, telecommunication. And then we get down to the government uh, supported services, the medical services, emergency, and government services. But these are critical infrastructures, and they are, in fact, at risk because of the um, SCADA systems and the interconnected controls that Joe Weiss was just alluding to in the uh, earlier presentation. So why should we be concerned? We have a lot of enemies. And let's be honest, things aren't going very well in the Middle East, and we are creating more enemies. A lot of people don't like us. The probability of being attacked in our own shores, or on our own shores, is increasing. Terrorism and acts of war, industry instability and downsizing, deregulation and disgruntled customers of our privatized uh, uh, critical infrastructures, and, uh, re resistance to the World Trade Organization. Every time they have a meeting, the anarchists follow them along, and there's riots. Uh, there's increasing electronic theft. Um, identity theft is the nation's number one um, white-collar crime. Uh, we have increasing hacking and hacktivism. Hacktivism is hacking for a political or social cause. Uh, a war dialer is an automatic program that goes through and dials up um, numbers, thousands of numbers in any given night, and will look for a connecting computer system. Uh, very similar to a ping sweeper or a port scanner or a sniffer. What you're doing is you're looking for automated connections to computer systems. You don't particularly care where those computer systems are. What you're looking for is a connection. Once you have that connection, then you start the hack. Now, we actually train hackers in my programs, my cyber core program. My students in that actually go to work for the federal government. Um, they go to work for the National Security Agency, the State Department, the Secret Service, the FBI. Uh, and so, yes, we do train 
hackers. We train hackers for offense and we train hackers for defense. My students are actively engaged in both. So things are connected. And I bring this slide up to show you the connectedness. Yes, on September 11, uh, people, buildings, power substations, subway substations, and telecommunication stations all went down. But look at the connectedness. Look at the emergency services and the communications that went offline. The New York Stock Exchange went offline. The banking and finance in that area was crippled. And air transportation was shut down for three days. Things are connected. If I shut off the electric power, what else am I going to get? If I put my good guy hat on, this collateral damage is terrible. But if I put my bad guy hat on, that collateral damage is great. Threat vectors. It hasn't happened yet. Some of this talk is doom and gloom. You had an ice storm here in the Seattle area. You lost, not ice storm, uh, wind, and, wind and storm. Really wasn't ice, right? Wind and cold. Uh, and you lost power for four days. But you didn't have hundreds and thousands of deaths, right? You just lost power. That's a natural disaster. Natural disasters will always be public enemy number one when it comes to critical infrastructures. Hurricane Katrina, look at what it did. Look at the ice storms in Nebraska about a month and a half ago. Look what they did. Look what happened here. Then, surprisingly enough, you have deliberate physical damage. And this data is true. You can look at the NERC, uh, North, uh, North American Electric Liability Council data, and you'll see that this, this is the uh, profile of damage to North American infrastructures. Deliberate physical damage comes next, then accidental damage, and somewhere down the list, nobody really knows where, is the cyber attacks and intrusions. And yes, they are in fact happening, and yes, they do damage. To my knowledge, nobody has died due to a cyber attack against a critical infrastructure, but damage has been done. Threat mode, the upper two quadrants are your traditional warfare. The bottom two are your relatively new warfare vectors, okay? So the upper two quadrants, are you're doing a physical attack against a physical target, bombs and bullets, or you're doing a physical attack against an electronic target. You're, what you're trying to do is shut down their uh, ability to communicate and their ability to gather information and uh, deploy forces. The bottom vector is your new information warfare, or information operations vectors. Over there on the far right, you have an electronic attack against an electronic target. This is where I'm trying to shut down the, the opposing, um, the opposition's information gathering, information uh, transmission operations. The bottom left vector is the newest form of warfare. What you're to, trying to do is an electronic attack and actually cause physical damage. And yes, we can do this. Recognize that real-time control structures have fail-safe operations. They have protective mechanisms. And what you want to do is hack in there and override those protective mechanisms so the pressures or the forces or the currents and voltage that are involved exceed the safe allowable allowances and physical damage occurs. I don't want to just shut the power off. I want to burn up the transformers. I don't want to just turn the generators off. I want to open up the floodgates and flood the towns below the dams. That's the information warfare vector that is emerging today. It's the electronic target against electronic warfare against physical targets. And it's not just the United States that's doing this. All civilized nations are doing this. We are all training operatives in this aspect. Physical attacks against infrastructures, yes. There have been several. Um, uh, I didn't go into 2004-2005 because I don't really want to talk about it, but these attacks are continuing. Look what happened in, 2000, in 2003. Pipe bombs at the base of a, of a, a high voltage transmission tower. In western Wyoming and Idaho, uh, the, the guy wires to five high voltage transmission towers were deliberately loosened with the attempt to actually turn those towers over. 
uh, 10 tower supports that was in the northwest. We don't want to talk about where. They were, the bracing bolts were intentionally removed and a New Hampshire uh, transmission tower was set on fire. These things happen. These are physical attacks right here in the United States. They happen, they happen mostly in the summer, but probably all year long. Cyber attacks. These attacks have happened. There's most of the attacks against critical infrastructures and utilities are targeting the IT information that's there. What they're doing is they're looking for money, they're looking for identity, they're looking for social security, they're looking for something that will finance operations. But sometimes they're actually looking to cause damage. Um, nobody knows what the guy hacking on the nuclear power station in Britain was trying to do. Um, the Cal ISO servers hacked by a China telecom, nobody knows whether that was really China or somebody that was filtering through China. To my knowledge, there has been no great damage caused by any of those. There is some damage, but not, not tremendous. There's a long history of telecom hacks. There's hacks against ISP. There was a hack against the Worcester, Massachusetts phones, the Escondida, California hospital. Uh, FBI actually has a tape of the guy who hacked a uh, Escondida, California hospital phone system and uh, hospital operator is pleading with him to allow her to make an outgoing call that's an emergency phone call and he's laughing at her. You can hear him laughing in the background. Um, Australia's sewage plant controls, Russian National Gas Company, and the U.S. Treasury have all been uh, targets of attacks. So these things happen. I asked my students to put on their attack hat and go out and do some things, and the next few slides are some of the things that they did. I asked them to go out and find SCADA passwords for control systems here in the Northwest. They came back, they had over 1,400 passwords that are posted online. Every default password and every active password is posted somewhere online. This includes all of your Cisco controls, all of your Microsoft, all your Alcatel, your ABNB, your Schweitzer, your IBM, your Linux, your Lucent, your Nortel, your Netgear. Everything is posted out there somewhere. Sometimes all you have to do is go to one hacker site and you get the entire password list. Now, that's scary, but what's even scarier is that when you go to the infrastructure and utility conferences and you ask for a show of hands, how many system engineers have changed the default passwords on the systems that they have implemented? And what you'll see is 30% or less. So 70, roughly 70% 70 of the critical infrastructure systems out there are still using the default passwords, and those default passwords are posted online. I asked the students to, I want you to target, actively target sites here in the Northwest, West Coast, but you need to hit at least three infrastructures. And they did so. They found one here in Seattle. Seattle, you are a target. Um, I, I'm not showing you Seattle because uh, it's kind of scary. This is a very large uh, sewage treatment plant with a, a lot of stored chemicals. Um, this is a rail system. And the rail system is interesting. And this is a freeway system. And the freeway system and the rail system are interesting because it gives us the means of delivering our payload. And I can structure an event right there and I will cause major damage to surface transportation. I will release poisonous gases and I will pollute that uh, water right there. And this is a major population center. And this was done entirely by the internet. And this was prior to uh, Google Earth. Using Google Earth, you can actually follow transmission lines and infrastructures more easily than you could. And the infrastructure maps and uh, distribution mechanisms are still posted on the internet. They were supposed to have been removed after 9-11, but I did some searching last week and I was able to find everything I needed to attack infrastructures here in the Northwest. So this was an exercise of the students. They did in all of this in, in the classroom. 
Now we're going to step outside the classroom. I had my students build a uh, wireless transceiver, 802.11 wireless transceiver. And what we're doing is we're driving and we drove from Pullman, Washington over to Portland and then up to Seattle and then back over to Spokane and then back down to Pullman, Washington. And we recorded, we just captured the packets that were being blown out in the air, in the clear, and the wireless networks that we found were hospitals and medical centers, port facilities, naval shipyards, high schools, colleges, universities, manufacturing plants, natural resource processing plants, research centers, rail, ferry, and highway facilities, and telecommunication utilities and ISPs. These are all blowing out in clear text, plain text, for anybody to watch, observe, and capture. So are things getting better or worse? This was a question that came up just prior to convening the panel here. In 1997, NSTAC, uh, National um, Secure, Secure Telecommunications Advisory Committee. If you just do a Google for NSTAC, you'll find the, the definition of that. It was a White House report. 1997, the White House did this report. And they found in Critical infrastructures in the United States, critical infrastructures. Weak passwords being used, default passwords were unchanged, passwords were posted visibly, shared logins, inadequate warning banners, unaware of the hacking threat, non existing security policies, unsecured modem access, IT interconnectivity, and inadequate intrusion detection. And from 2002 to 2005, we did some on-site security analyses here in the Northwest, and Barbara was a part of those analyses. And we visited 24 different sites, and we found everything that they had found six years earlier, plus we found that there were internet connectivity between the SCADA systems and the IT systems. And every site we visited, there was a back door to the SCADA system from the internet. We found wireless networks that were in place, and for the most part, they were unguarded. And we found commercialization of the, communi of the communication lines. Utilities are trying to make extra dollars by selling their spare fiber, their spare copper. And now you have the shared facility going on in the communications that are controlled by the utilities. So are things getting better or worse? Um, we could say they're getting worse, but in fact, they're incrementally getting better because the industry is more and more aware of the problems that we see. So my summary, our infrastructures were optimized for reliability in a relatively benign environment. Okay? We haven't had the wars and the riots and the catastrophes that other nations have on a regular basis. We have a very stable, benign society. And our infrastructures have evolved in that benign environment. But there's an increasingly computer literate world out there. And we have a lot of adversaries that are connected to the internet. Attack information is free and easy to get. Everything I've shown you can be done in the classroom. Everything I've shown you is done by my students without actually leaving campus, with the exception of the war driving exercise. Physical attacks have occurred. Several cyber attacks have also occurred. It's just a matter of time before we have one of those events where the cyber attack actually causes physical damage. Thank you. I think you'll agree with me that Paul's comments are nothing short of stunning. We grew up at a time when we took for granted that our lights worked, the water works. There's parts of the world where that's not the case. But this has also been a blessing as well as a curse because it's very difficult to think of a time when that might not be true. And so these very systems that we rely on for our comfortable living may indeed not be there at some point in time, may be vulnerable in ways we hadn't thought about before because of the unintended consequences of the information age. Things are interconnected and it bears paying attention to. But as Paul said, things aren't all dire. There is increasing awareness of this particular problem and we have some time 
to perhaps get those things in place that can mitigate against these issues. Unintended Consequences of the Information Age, a colloquium series that explores controversial issues emerging from our point-and-click world. Our infrastructures, online and vulnerable. Presented by the Center for Information Assurance and Cybersecurity and sponsored by the UW Institute for National Security Education and Research and the UW Master of Strategic Planning for Critical Infrastructures online graduate program. With additional support from the Information School, the Pacific Northwest Center for Global Security, and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory 